And you may be seated. Uh, I just want to introduce uh, Pastor Sterling. He's going to the pulpit or he's going up on stage right now. He is uh, just a tremendous man of faith. He's been a deacon. He's been the secretary of the deacons team. He's been a member of this church since it was first uh, started. Uh, Barb has been the secretary. Barb is his wife of the church. Uh, he's a lay pastor. He's done his training. He's done his homework. He is a faithful, dependable man of God. It's my privilege to uh, allow him, allow him, <laughs> it's my privilege to, to have him minister to us this morning, and I'm looking forward to the word that God has given you. Thank you, Sterling. Thank you. I'm still sort of a pulpit kind of guy with, from all my stuff. <laughs> First of all, this morning, thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. First of all, this morning, I went to... Um, have a few scriptures that we're going to read together. There are four in all, four portions of scripture. And um, so the first one will be uh, Philippians 3, uh, 12 to 14. And uh, those are on the screen. So I'm going to ask, uh, if we could please, to read these together. So I'm going to ask you to stand for a moment. And uh, out of respect for the scriptures, and we'll read these together. And they go as follows. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So those are words of Paul from Philippians 3. Now we're going to go to uh, Philippians 4. I'm going to be quoting Paul quite a bit this morning. So Philippians 4 uh, verses 6 to 8. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Then we're going to go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And finally, the last one, uh, very short. This is Hebrews 13, 8. And this one is kind of my central one for today. It will be eventually. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Let's have a little word of prayer. Lord God, we just ask this morning, Father, that you would open up our hearts and our minds, Lord, to what you'd have us learn this day from your word. And we'll just thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. There's one thing that I want to mention. Um, if I bend over once in a while and pick this up, it's because I'm only a few months short of 80, and when you get to that stage, you get dry real fast. <laughs> it could be because of some of the medication I take too, but anyway. When Andrew asked me uh, a few weeks back if I would speak today, and I said, yes, I will. And uh, then I got to thinking, what am I going to speak about? Uh, I think it should be something that has to do with maybe what has been going on in our church lately. Thank you, Gordy. 
I knew you were coming up for something. <laughs> Thanks, Gord. And uh, I got to thinking about, well, one of the most obvious things that's been going on in our church lately is, is you know, a lot of things are changing, right? A lot of things are changing. And I thought, I don't know if I want to speak about change again. Everybody's speaking about change these days. But yet, it would fit in, I guess, with what's been going on. Then I got to thinking about it more, and I thought, you know, that's true, but there's one thing, there's a caution here. There's a warning about this that I want to bring to you today, and that's kind of going to be what I'm leading up to, and we will knit those scriptures together that we just read, and there will be several other scriptures as well. But there is a warning I want to bring to you today. Also, uh, as I've learned over the years and so on, that sometimes there's a it's a good idea when you're up to, to bring a message or whatever to, to have a joke to start out with, with. And I thought, well, I'm going to try to find a joke about change in the church. Well, guess what? I couldn't find any. <laughs> I couldn't find any joke about change in the church. So, that must mean then that change in the church is no joke. And that is the joke. <laughs> Having been a member of Hillcrest Baptist now for almost 60 years, Barb and I, and there's a few others, there's a few others that are still hanging on in our category, and we're happy about that. But for almost 60 years, I have seen and have been a part of many changes. Change is not new in the church. I've seen changes in ministry, changes in pastors, changes in music, changes in expectations, changes in attitude, changes in church membership as people come and go and pass away, changes in dress, changes in preaching styles, changing in, changes in children and youth work, changes in the physical church building. The list could go on and on. Most recently, of course, have been the changes that have been associated with the Buckingham recommendations. And these are probably some of the most significant changes that have taken place in the history of Hillcrest Baptist, and they're far from done yet. Not, but the thing is, there are changes that are going to be evident and are evident in our physical building. But I think more important than that are the changes that are taking place in our hearts. Amen. Our approach to worship, our approach to ministry, and many other aspects of our spiritual lives together. Those are really the crucial changes. And it made me realize that change in life is inevitable. Here's what Jack Canfield, who was co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, said about change. He said, change is inevitable in life. You can either resist it and potentially get run over by it, or you can choose to cooperate with it, adapt to it, and learn how to benefit from it. When you embrace change, you will begin to see it as an opportunity for growth. Someone else said, an anonymous quote that I came across, says that there are three C's in life. Choice, chance, and change. You must make the choice to take the chance if you want anything in life to change. You have a choice, you must take the chance if you want anything in life to change. And that applies, of course, to our lives together here at Hillcrest. So no matter what your age, whether you're 10 or whether you're 100, change will have taken place in your lifespan. Look at the changes in technology in the last 10 years. Just mind-boggling. Thinking about all of this, I felt I would like to examine the concept of change purely from a, a Christian standpoint, so to speak, and to see if there might be any pitfalls of which we should be aware. I came across an article in Christianity Today, and in part it said, there's only one good reason to move a church toward change. Because the mission demands it. 
This is also the only way to sustain the change in the long term. This is why, despite all the bad reasons for and against change, the church must constantly be in a state of mission-driven change. Well, okay, that's fine. But what is mission-driven change? It sounds like we should know what it's about. And uh, that also got me to thinking that our own Baptist Convention, Canadian Baptists of Atlantic Canada, by the way, if you're new to Hillcrest, if you're new to the Baptist denomination, you must realize that we are not a standalone church. We are a part of a larger organization known as the Canadian Baptists of Atlantic Canada often shortened to CBAC. So we're not alone. We're in this with, I think it's 450, Andrew, somewhere in that neighborhood of churches within the uh, Atlantic provinces. It used to be up around 600, I guess, years ago. But anyway, be aware of that. And in recent years, the convention has told us that they would like us to become, uh, not just us, but all the churches in Atlantic provinces, Baptist churches, to become more missional. I thought, well, that sounds good too, but do we understand what missional really means? Lo and behold, on the Baptist convention website, there is a definition, and they refer to it there as a mission edge church. A Mission Edge Neighborhood Church is a church displaying the good news of Jesus in both word and deed in its local community in ongoing, relevant, and contextual ways for their locality. Then it goes on to talk about uh, seeking to reach those beyond uh, our neighborhoods and uh, so forth. So um, they, uh, our convention refers to this as a Mission Edge Church. And I'm of the firm belief that Hillcrest Baptist is well on its way in 2020 to being a Mission Edge Church. Now, we have several outreach initiatives of various forms going on already. So we reach out to people. We try to help them with their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. Now, we haven't arrived yet. We haven't become really good at it. Uh, nor probably will we ever become really good at it, but we will strive towards that. We haven't yet arrived. But even the Apostle Paul, go back to Paul and look at the issue he had at one point in his life. He wanted so badly to know Christ completely and fully, yet he knew at one point that he still hadn't reached that goal. In Philippians 3, we read this. These are the words of Paul to the church at Philippi. He said, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, now listen to this, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I believe that is what exactly we are doing here at Hillcrest Baptist Church. Amid all of the, quote, changes, we are pressing on towards that goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Change, as you all know, and Andrew's already alluded to uh, the meeting on Wednesday evening. We weren't able to be there. We were away. But he alluded to that meeting. And from that, we know that change does not come easily. All this talk about change in the church can be scary. It can be messy. And sometimes very frustrating and upsetting if things aren't going well. But you know what? The scriptures have an antidote for that as, all, as well. Now, the concept of, tw of change can be found in various places in the, in the scriptures in different contexts. But the one I like is Philippians 4, 6 to 8. Again, our old friend Paul says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, 
which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice what he said. Do not be anxious about anything. If you're anxious about something concerning the changes here at Hillcrest, Paul says, don't be anxious. Go to prayer and petition to God with thanksgiving in your hearts and present those concerns to God. And what will happen if we are faithful? He said, the peace of God will transcend all understanding and will guard your hearts. And then he goes on to say, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, did you catch that? I believe if we move forward with these words of Paul in mind, We should have little to fear about the changes that will be forthcoming. There will be timing issues, yes, but we should have little fear about changes that will be forthcoming because if we initiate changes that are pure, true, noble, right, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy, then we are on the right track. Now, Accepting the fact that change is inevitable and should be embraced, there is a word of warning that I want to bring to you this morning. There is a word of caution. Because there is something that should not be changed or tampered with in any way during this process. And that something, in quotes, that something is the message the message should not be changed. The message of the gospel or the good news of how Christ took care of the sin issue on the cross for you and for me and all that that involves, this cannot be changed or tampered with in any way, shape, or form. Now, God's word as found in the Bible cannot be changed or diluted in any way. We cannot embrace some of the Bible and discard the rest. We cannot say, I believe this part of the Bible, but I don't believe that part. From Genesis to Revelation, this is the complete Word of God. It's inspired, it's relevant, it's free from error, and it all points to Christ, His teachings, His ministry here on earth, and his sacrifice on the cross for you and for me. There are several scriptures that back that up, but the one I like is this, 2 Timothy. Oh, Paul, here we are again, Paul. Isn't Paul a great guy? 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Because every book in the Bible eventually points to Christ and his message of salvation, which can't be changed, I want to focus now for a few minutes on the central figure, and that is the figure of Christ. And the verse that I want to expand on just for a few minutes today is that verse in Hebrews 13, verse 8. A short verse, but very powerful. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's say that together. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's not a hard one to memorize, is it? (laughs) Oh, I just got to remember that I'm not teaching grade 5 anymore. (laughs) I want to unpack that verse just for a few minutes today to help you to understand why Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I suspect there are many, many reasons, but I want to deal with three uh, reasons this morning. The first one is this. Because of Christ's lordship, his lordship. Now, Matthew 28, verse 18 says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now just keep that thought in mind for a moment or two because I want to just elaborate a little bit more on what we mean by the Lordship of Christ. It means simply this, that his ownership over us takes precedence over our own personal rights. His ownership over us takes precedence over our own personal rights. It means that we who are followers of Christ should have total and unreserved obedience to him. His lordship over us is complete. Why? Because all authority in heaven and earth was given to him. Well, by whom? Who gave him that authority? Well, his father, the Lord God. Jack Wellman, a Christian author and pastor, had this to say. He said this, If you have repented of your sins, confessed them to God, and then placed your trust in Christ, then he is your Lord, and he has all rights and authority to have lordship over you. If not, then you are still in your sin. Now this often goes contrary to the way we think, isn't it? Our human thoughts and our wishes. We want to do our own thing occasionally. God has given us a measure of free will and the ability to think and to reason things for ourselves if the situation calls for it. However, during those free will times, we must be careful not to stray outside of his lordship over our lives as our Lord and Savior. Because his lordship, his lordship does not change. So that leaves us with a question this morning. And I have a question for you. I have a question for me. And the question is this, is Jesus the Lord of your life today? Now, the second way that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow is this, because of his language. Now, Romans 1, 16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. In Hebrews 4, 12, we read, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now language. Language is how we communicate with each other. In the world today, there are something like 6,500 languages with an untold number of dialects. There are also specialized languages. People who work in the world of computers have a special language all their own. People who are deep into certain sports speak a different language when they talk about their favorite sport. People who work in a specialized trade will speak a different language using words that describe that trade. Even within the Atlantic provinces, from Newfoundland to Nova Scotia, there are regional differences in language, words, and phrases which people use. But did you realize and do you know that today we are sometimes a little bit afraid of language? Why? Because oftentimes when we want to express an opinion, we have to consider if what we have to say is politically correct or Are we going to offend someone? And this attitude, this way of thinking has even entered our Christian faith in some places. There are churches and there are people today who want to tone down our language when we use words like sin, heaven, hell, forgiveness, redemption, salvation, atonement, and so on. Those are specialized words that we use as Christians. Now, it is true that when we use these words, when we speak these words, we should do so carefully and we should do in such a way that others will know what we're talking about and will be able to understand them and apply them to their lives. 
One Christian article that I uh, read through put it this way. I neglected to write down the name of the article, but the article said this, political correctness is a blatant contradiction of the teachings of Scripture, particularly in Ephesians 4, as well as many other places. Christians could, could or Christians should consider what they do and what they say in the light of Scripture, not in the opinions of those who advocate things that are against Scripture. And, uh, there, and this statement, I think, is quite powerful. Therefore, Christians should not worry too much about being politically correct. They should boldly focus on being biblically correct. In fact, the Bible is even clear that to those who are lost, or as one, one version of the Bible puts it, hell-bent on destruction, for those that are hell-bent on destruction, as one version puts it, the Word of God does seem to be offensive. In fact, it seems to be foolish and silly. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And this is again what Paul commented on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So it's clear then that there will be some unsaved people who will be offended or believe the language of the gospel is foolish and of no account. However, I would contend that we should not apologize when we use the language of the gospel because it is Jesus language and it's another reason why he is the same yesterday today and forever we can't be ashamed of the gospel because it is God's inspired word God's inspired language and because Jesus is the son of God it is his inspired word and inspired language also we dare not tamper with it or attempt to water it down as a lot of people say today it is what it is. Finally, Je finally then, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, thirdly, because of his love. Now, Psalm 105, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Now, there's a very well-known or fairly well-known uh, chapter on love in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, I'm not going to read all 13 verses, but I am going to read verses 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot in those verses. I just want to say one or two things. This is about the love of Jesus, the love of God. That's a very big topic. We could spend hours talking about that, but we won't. I only want to make a couple of points. God's love is found throughout scriptures in different contexts. And uh, in a moment, I'll just to look at those verses in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Um, actually, the first 13 verses of that chapter deal with a very special kind of love. And throughout the Bible, there's love used in around four ways, actually, depending on the circumstances. And we have to go back to the original Greek words uh, that describe that love. There's the word eros, which refers to romantic love. There's storge, which refers to family love. There's philia, which is brotherly love. And then there's agape. That's God's love. For this morning, I want to stress that in the verses I read from 1 Corinthians 13, it is God's agape love that is indicated in the original Greek. And what is it? What is God's agape love? It is God's unconditional, no strings attached love for you and for me. It's the same kind of love that we should have for God and by extension that we should have for everyone around us. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, the first 13 verses, love is a 
is mentioned approximately 17 times, and in every case, it's the Greek form of the word agape. And then in the final verse, verse 13, we read this, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's agape love. That's God's love. Years ago, there was a man by the name of Watchman Nee. He was a Chinese Christian and a scholar. He had a 30-year ministry in China during the mid-20th century. He said this, The nature of God's love is unchangeable. Ours alternates all too readily. It is our ha- if it is our habit to love God with our own affection, we shall turn cold towards him whenever we are unhappy. So what he's saying here basically is this, that the nature of God's agape love is unchangeable. It doesn't change. And that's another reason why Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, in this time of constant change within the church, within the church proper, we can take comfort in the fact that no matter what's going on all around us, Christ's lordship and his language and his love are changeless. They remain constant. And that should be of great comfort to all of us because our lives are finite. We're born, we live our allotted time, and then we die. And as Christians, we believe that God gave us life. And if we put our faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, that he will eventually call us home to be with him. Psalm 90 verse 12 tells us to number our days so that we may use them wisely. No one knows when God will call our souls home. Psalm 90.10 says that our years are three score and ten. That's 70 years. Well, many people today exceed that. But the fact still remains that we experience time as finite. And because of that, we want to make sure that our relationship with Christ is, secu- is secure today. Have you confessed your sins and asked Christ for forgiveness? Is your relationship with Christ a bit off the track lately? There's no better time than today to set things right. You can do that right where you're sitting by a simple prayer. And I think I'm going to just take a moment or two and don't ask everyone to bow your heads. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands or to come forward, but I am going to kind of ask ask each person here to kind of, in an imaginary way, draw a little circle around yourself, excluding everything that's around you, and inside that circle is you and Christ. So if there's anybody here today who has a need, anybody here today who hasn't fully accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, Anybody here today whose Christian walk has gone off the track a little bit? Or if there's anybody here today who has uh, a concern for a friend or a relative or whatever it might be, let's just take a few moments of silence. God tells us in one place to be silent and listen. So let's do that. Let's pray to God for a few moments now in silence. Father, we are your people. We are your children. And Lord, I have no idea what's going on in everybody's lives here today, but you do. 
And Lord, even if there's just one person here this morning whose prayer has been or will be answered shortly, then Lord, our time together will have been of benefit. So Lord, I would, I pray that you would listen, that you would hear our prayers that have been lifted up here in the last few moments. We'll thank you, God, for your answers that will come. Amen. And we know, we know as Christians that he will answer our prayers. He will guide you. He will direct you. He will protect you. He will be your shepherd because his lordship, his language, and his love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The church may change, and that's no joke, but Christ and his message is changeless. Let me leave you with just a few uh, words from Jude 25 as a benediction. To the only God and our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages. Notice this, now and forevermore. Amen.